Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Aperioversa, Vesicle's Highly Multiplexed Immunohistochemistry Approach to Drug Discovery. I'm Susie Valdez of LabRoots, and I will be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Leica Biosystems. To learn more, visit them at leicabiosystems.com. Now, we encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you might have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have any trouble seeing or hearing this presentation. Now, I'd like, now like to welcome our speaker, Dr. Michael Johnson, the Chief Executive Officer of Visical Inc. For a full biography of our speaker, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Michael, welcome. You may now begin your presentation, sir. Well, thank you for the introduction. My name is Michael Johnson, and I'll be talking today about Leica's Aperoversa 8, and also Visicol's highly multiplex immunohistochemistry approach to drug discovery. Now, before I get started, I just wanted to show our disclaimer here. So Leica Biosystems did not sponsor uh, the studies that will be described within this presentation or the work behind this presentation. Now, to get started, uh, just to provide an outline of what we're discussing today, the first piece is an overview on Visicol, so you have more of an understanding about what our company does and how we interact with our clients and how we provide contract research services to our clients. The next piece will be background on immuno-oncology and multiplexing, talk about where multiplexing came from and why it's important. Then we'll dive into our unique approach to multiplex tissue imaging, which we refer to as our Visicol multiplex immunofluorescence approach. We're going to talk about a few example applications about how we apply multiplex imaging in practice. And lastly, once we generate a number of different imaging files from slides, how do we use those to actually answer questions during the drug discovery and development pipeline? To kick it off, our company, Visicol, is a contract research services company that's highly focused on imaging, advanced cell culture models, and digital pathology. We see our mission as helping our pharma clients and biotech clients transform their tissues and cells into large data sets using advanced imaging, and then mine those data sets for something useful to help them answer their questions as part of their drug discovery and development efforts. We work very closely with our clients on their projects, and we work on a number of different key areas, such as high content screening and drug discovery assays, histopathology, multiplex IHC, and digital path, tissue clearing and confocal and light sheet 3D imaging, and then also 3D cell culture assay services. Where we're leveraging 3D cell culture models and high content imaging to characterize these models in their entirety. And today we have over uh, 12 of the top 20 pharma companies as clients and have worked on several dozen programs for our clients and all different types of disease applications from infectious disease to rare orphan uh, diseases all the way to cancer and diabetes and everything in between. The way that clients work with us varies a lot from clients to clients. We're very flexible in how we work with our clients, but ultimately our whole goal in interacting with our clients is trying to help them answer their specific research questions. And generating data isn't typically what we're focused on. It's generating lots of data, but distilling that data down into something useful, whether it's a graph, a table, or a report that allows them to better answer their research question and to move their program forward. Typically with a lot of our clients, what we're trying to do is accelerate the time to market for new therapeutics, or we're trying to help our clients fail their drugs more quickly. We don't want to spend resources on moving drugs through our drug discovery pipeline if they shouldn't move forward. So we're trying to help clients fail faster and also answer unique research questions during this drug discovery process. The way clients work with us, it varies from client to client. Some clients will send us uh, blocks of tissue, whether they're uh, paraffin embedded, whether they're wet tissues. Uh, some clients will send us digital files or hard drives if we're just doing digital image analysis. And other clients will send us compounds or antibodies for full end-to-end -end in vitro assays. We're generating high-content imaging data. We might be doing histology and multiplex imaging. 
and then other endpoints such as ELISA's um, and QPCR as well, depending upon what the project specifically entails. While our main focus as a company is imaging, we also employ a number of other readouts for our assays, depending upon what our clients are specifically interested in. But the whole goal for all this work is a toner of a report that allows our clients to be in a better, more informed position to make decisions. Now, multiplexing refers to the use of multiple labels to look at a slide. So when we're closely referring to multiplexing, we're not talking about traditional IHC or maybe having two um, labels per slide. We're talking about four or five, 10, 20, 30 labels per slide and trying to answer a lot of different research questions all about one singular slide. The introduction of several uh, immuno-oncology therapeutics into the marketplace, along with our improved understanding of how the immune system interacts with disease, has prompted researchers to require much more complicated tools for how they study tissues in particular. We don't want to look at just one immune cell marker. We want to look at two or three. We want to look at the interplay between many different types of immune cell markers, and then also secondary and tertiary effects as well, such as apoptosis and cell death and cell proliferation, and try to understand how all these parameters change in the context of how the immune system is interacting with therapeutics and also how the immune system is interacting with infectious diseases as well, which I'll get to a bit later. So the case for multiplexing is we have very complex research questions and we're finally now in a position computationally where we can take all that data from a slide and actually process it and turn it into something useful. Multiplexing does not employ traditionally a pathologist. It's employing computer algorithms to actually take these large data sets and distill it down to something useful, which I'll get to later in the presentation as well. But some of the kind of questions that we're looking at, which are quite complex and challenging to understand with traditional histopathology and imaging, are things like understanding how effective T cells are at infiltrating into a tumor. Try to understand how T cells are being activated. T cell recruitment, uh, cancer killing efficacy. We're trying to understand the distribution of immune cells, how they're interacting with each other, where they are, and what they're doing. And this requires looking at multiple biomarkers at the exact same time. The traditional technique, which I've alluded to, is immunohistochemistry. We're looking at one, maybe two, maybe three markers per slide, but um, deconvolving those can be challenging, and labeling those and developing those panels can be pretty challenging. So with traditional techniques, we're usually limited in how many labels we can get from a single slide. Now, because of this limitation, we've developed in the uh, field a number of approaches for going far beyond two and three labels up to 5, 10, 15, 20, even up to 37 uh, labels per slide. There's a category of fluorescence-based approaches, and there's also a category of um, imaging mass cytometry-based approaches. With fluorescence, what we're doing is we're tagging antibodies um, with fluorescent probes. This allows us to simultaneously, depending upon the imager we're working with, and the availability of epitopes and antibody species, up to five to seven markers all at the same time but we can go beyond five to seven markers using a bunch of different types of techniques that are out there, one of which, which is our technique, which I'll talk about in more detail, um, allows us to strip antibodies uh, from slides such that we can label slides, strip the antibodies, relabel, re-image, and do that process sequentially such that we can move well beyond five to seven markers per slide. There's also bleaching-based approaches. We're bleaching the fluorescence from slides, which allows us to go ahead and have multiple rounds of labeling. During that process, we're still leaving the antibodies behind. There's also co-detection by indexing or fluorescent immunohisto PCR. And there's also fluorescent tyramide mediated amplification. All these techniques have their own unique advantages and disadvantages. Some require specialized equipment for processing and imaging. Some require proprietary reagents, which are challenging to access and challenging to adapt for your specific epitope if it's outside of commonly used uh, markers for these types of studies. Um, but typically, it's relatively rapid. We can get about five to seven channels of imaging data at 40x and about 30 to 120 minutes, depending upon how much tissue we have on our slide. And we're able to get a lot of data from a single slide using these fluorescent-based approaches. Cytoff is a different type of technique. It also uses antibodies for labeling, but instead of being conjugated to um, fluorescent probes or secondary labeling of fluorescent probes, we're using metal ions that are conjugated. These are metal ions that don't um, occur naturally in the environment, and we're using mass cytometry to go ahead and process these antibodies after we ablate the tissue. 
So we're blading a small region on the tissue, and we're moving that ablation region around the tissue as a pixel. And from that one micron pixel, we're able to generate imaging data from a slide using mass cytometry. So really cool technique where we're turning mass cytometry data into imaging data that we can then use to process. So we get to almost the same result that we're getting from fluorescence, but a very different and unique approach to do it. With this IMC-based approach, we can go all the way up to 37 markers per slide, which is awesome for a lot of research questions. We want to get lots of markers, but it tends to be a bit slower in image acquisition compared to fluorescence. And we're also looking at a smaller area typically on a slide because of how long it takes compared to fluorescence. And our equivalent uh, magnification for this approach because of the pixel size or blading tissues is about one micron, so about 10x uh, magnification equivalent uh, thereabouts. Technique, though, has great uh, background noise, so background noise is incredibly low because of these metal ions not naturally occurring. Um, both these approaches are great for multiplexing questions. It really depends on your budget and exactly what your research question is for which one of these works best for your research application. Like all imaging tools, there's not one that's best for everything. They're all unique to your specific application. The approach that I'll dive into more in this presentation is our Visicol Multiplex Immunofluorescence Approach, or VMIF for short, which we use here at Visicol to help us address this problem of moving beyond traditional histopathology. Now, there's several multiplex uh, immunofluorescence approaches which I've talked about and mentioned. They all have their unique advantages and disadvantages, but they all get to the same place, which is getting five plus labeling per slide. We at Visicol, though, we wanted to create an approach that was really easy to use and was not, um, did not require proprietary labels. We could use any antibody that was already validated in traditional histopathology. We wanted to create a technique that did not require specialized tissue processing equipment. We could just do it by hand on the bench top, or we could use processing equipment if we wanted to speed things up. We wanted to develop a technique that was compatible with any fluorescent imager, and also wanted to make the technique easy to develop new antibody panels for, and to be able to be flexible with existing antibodies that we've already validated. And we developed this technique, which we're referring to as VMIF, and I'll get more into it in a second how it works. And we only launched this platform in late 2020, and have been using it with uh, several of our uh, pharma clients for about a year now through our beta testing process. But a very robust platform, which I'll dive more into in the next few slides here. To give you a sense of the workflow of this process, typically we start the process with our validated panels that we've developed. Most of these are focused on immuno-oncology applications or developing custom panels. Now with this technique, what we're doing is we're labeling three to five antibodies with DAPI on a slide. We're validating each one of those panels individually, and then we've developed an antibody stripping reagent that removes the antibodies from the slides. So we're labeling um, a slide with three to five antibodies with DAPI for our nuclear stain. We're then imaging, and then we're stripping those antibodies off of the slide, relabeling with another panel of three to five antibodies with DAPI, re-imaging, and repeating the process again and again. So we can do two, three, four, five, six panels sequentially after each other, after one another, and generate a hyperstack of data. Now, during processing, the slide might move a little bit, the sample might move, there might be slight changes in swelling or shrinking of the tissue, and all of those sections and align them manually really isn't feasible. So we developed an elastic co-registration approach where we can take all those panels and using DAPI as our ground truth, we can realign all of those individual channels into one large hyperstack of data. And that allows us to create a composite image of that slide from all those different channels, even though we didn't take all those channels at the exact same time. So we're using DAPI as our ground truth and aligning from DAPI. Now, once we have this image file, one of the big pain points that we ran into was actually getting the data to our clients. These files are very large in size, and with folks working from home with COVID, a lot of people don't have access to strong enough computers or fast enough computers to actually load these images and open them. A lot of folks don't have their image analysis software on their personal computers at home and can't remote access into their work computers to actually open up these files. So getting the file to our clients was always a challenge. And for any imaging-based data, this is a big bottleneck. So we developed this platform called BitSlide. I'll dive into this more in a bit and show a, a tutorial on this. 
But this slide is a cloud-based sharing platform that we use where we can upload the data, and then clients can zoom in, they can pan around the data, they can annotate it, they can change the contrast, they can change all these different parameters about the images uh, for multiplex and also bright field slide scans such that they can actually interact with the data. And they never have to download it. They can look at it through a browser, on a tablet, on their smartphone, on their computer. They never have to download the data. They can if they want to, but they're able to easily access it. And they can quickly say back to us, hey, this stain doesn't look right, or we want to change this, or that looks great. Let's keep going on the project. So this slides away for us to easily interact with our clients and share the data such that the transition from starting a project to getting results to our clients is much faster. And then lastly, we have a suite of image analysis software that we refer to as three screen. This is an internal software package that we've developed. It's not a SaaS product that we sell or license. We use this internally. And it's a toolbox of, of uh, different tools for analyzing these data sets. So for quantifying things like T cell penetration, counting different types of immune cells, all different types of questions that relate to quantifying features within slides, we use this software for. And ultimately, this software is being used to generate our report that's coming from each of these slides, which I'll dive into a little bit later here. The stripping reagent that we developed, we are referring to as Easy Clear. This is an approach where we're labeling slides. In this case, I'm showing just a, a brain section with MAP2, DFAP, and DAPI. We're labeling that slide. We're stripping off the antibodies, and you see this reduction in fluorescence. And then we can go ahead and actually relabel again with the exact same um, antibodies in this case and show that there's no degradation to the epitopes, the labeling is exactly the same, there's concordance between these two. So we can go um, through this process many times, we go up to about half a dozen times, if not more per slide, depending upon the tissue, and generate a lot of labels from a single tissue just simply by stripping off those antibodies and relabeling again and again in between our imaging runs. Next technology behind this, which I alluded to, was our co-registration approach. So these slides will be slightly off from one another, as will the stacks of images. And it's crucial for any kind of image analysis to be able to put all this data back together so all of our different channels line up perfectly with one another. And the way we do this is this elastic co-registration approach, where in this case I'm showing in red here uh, one set of DAPI and then in green, another set of DAPI from a different panel, and how we take this elastic co-registration approach to align those two data sets with one another, and then correspondingly, all the other channels associated with that panel and DAPI are now aligned with one another. This approach works very well, and we employ this in all these projects to give our clients a really crisp image and set of data from their slides. COVID, of course, has enhanced this, but the problem of getting to data to clients has always been there. COVID has just made it much worse based upon folks working from home with slow internet connections, uh, slow personal computers, and lack of access to uh, software to look at images. This is even worse for lychee and confocal images, which we're building BitSlide out to do as well currently. But this is a secure, encrypted, and permanently backed up portal for data. It's robust and it's served on um, Amazon Web Services. Uh, we're working to make it 21 CFR part one compliant. Uh, we can uh, view full 40X imaging data right on a web browser, so you can look at it on your phone, on your tablet, without ever downloading the data. And it loads very quickly, which I'll show an example of in a moment. We can toggle channels, we can adjust the contrast, we can annotate images and show to someone else. We can share with someone else on our team. And we can also download the screenshots or the raw imaging data if we'd like. So it's a very extensible platform that allows us to easily share our data with our clients, which again is a major bottleneck with these studies. So just to, um, to give you a view, I'm gonna play a, um, an overview of BitSlide and how it actually works here and show some of the functionality behind it. Now you're seeing here the interface for BitSlide. Prior to this screen, there's a dashboard where if you have a project and let's say you have 30 or 40 slides, you'll have view and a tile for each one of those slides. And you can click each one and you can zoom in. And the corresponding uh, slide name for that slide will of course be the file name for that slide. But in this case, I'm just showing um, a panel here with DAPI, Granzyme B, CD3, PAN-CK, and KI67 for cell proliferation. And we're showing how we can turn channels on and off. 
We can zoom in and out. And even though this is on a web browser or on a tablet, I can easily load these images. I can easily zoom. I can easily pan. I don't have to download the whole image before I can get started. And the level of clarity and the level of detail is absolutely fantastic with this platform. So this allows our clients to just log in, say, hey, the pan CK isn't looking great, or hey, this contrast needs to be adjusted differently than how it is right now. Or they might say, hey, the DAPI staining, like on this slide here, is a little bit too intense. Let's pair that back and lower our intensity for imaging of that specific channel. We also have these toggle buttons for annotating the slides, uh, which allows us to go ahead and have uh, features shared between different pathologists or different team members. And we can also open this up and then share it to other folks on our team. We can measure uh, specific features based upon the metadata behind the actual image files. So it allows us to do all the things that you expect in a traditional viewer with the added bonus of being compatible with multiple channel uh, immunofluorescent data coming from multiplex imaging. The, um, the VIMF approach that we have, it's relatively affordable on a per slide basis. Uh, it ranges from $1,000 to $2,500 per slide for five to 15 labels. The variation there is a lot to do with the cost of the antibodies and what specifically we're labeling for. Um, and this is at 20x resolution of a whole slide scan. So we're able to add many channels to a slide um, at this price point and generate a huge amount of data. And this is inclusive of sharing the data and providing access and storage to it as well. The throughput for the approach that we have is we can do about a slide every one to two hours. So we can process about 20 slides a day in practice. Um, so we can do a few hundred slides per week with multiple uh, slide scanners and really crank through projects of larger scales um, as they come to us. Resolution, we can go up to 40x, but in practice, usually we're looking at 20x, which reduces our slide scan time quite a bit. And then labels, usually most of our projects, I would say, have about eight labels, but we can go up to about 15 reliably with this platform. Uh, we've done projects with four and five as well, but usually around eight or nine is a sweet spot for folks looking at multiplex labeling. For more labels, if you wanted to go 15, 20, 25, 30, um, that's when we start to look at the imaging mass cytometry based approach. We'll look at lots of labels per slide instead of trying to optimize an approach like this for that. It becomes more economical to go after the IMC based approach for tons of labels per slide for us. The example application I was going to talk about, or one of the two I was going to talk about, was work that we're doing currently with Hackensack Meridian Health through a grant with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. This is a project we started recently. And it's aimed specifically at tuberculosis. So while we talk about multiplexing, usually in the context of immuno-oncology, infectious disease is another huge area in which multiplexing is highly important, allows us to really answer complex research questions. So for tuberculosis, this is a disease that's been around for a long time and always plagued mankind. Today, it's more so, of course, in developing nations. And in 2019, unfortunately, 1.4 million people died from tuberculosis. The impact of this disease is huge. Um, the Dartois lab is focused on developing rational drug regimens for treatment of TB. We don't have great treatments today. We have effective treatments, but there's still room for improvement for tre uh, treating TB. Uh, preliminary data has shown that drugs differentially penetrate TB granulomas. These are the survival niches in which the bacteria live. And we need to be able to get into those niches to actually treat the tuberculosis, especially in stubborn cases. And understanding how drugs co-localize with the various cell types in granulomas is important in ensuring that drugs can access and kill persistent uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis populations within the lungs. So really crucial research questions to understand what regimens that we can adopt and change to better treat these patients with this persistent disease. For this project, it's not even just multiplex fluorescent imaging. It's also combining our VMIF approach with MALDI. So we're moving beyond just one type of multiplexing to two types of multiplexing and trying to understand not only what immune cells are there, um, but what's going on with the therapeutics that we're dosing uh, these animals with. In this case, this is a rabbit model that we're working with, of course. Um, and we're looking side by side, a slide that we're using for multiplex immunofluorescence with MALDI, and we're lining up those data sets with one another such that we can actually generate uh, just significantly more data 
And we're also using LCM as well uh, with some of the um, endpoints of this project to generate three different types of multiplexing data per single um, granuloma that we're looking at. And we're using similar co-registration software to do with the Malvi data that we're using for the fluorescence data such that we can actually line up all of those data sets on top of one another and we can click through, just like I showed with our BitSlide platform, each one of those different channels. One of them, of course, is going to be Malvi and we're looking at LCM as well. So we're going to have other channels in addition to our fluorescence channels. We're able to get all that data into one single hyperstack to start understanding exactly what's going on in that slide by comparing multimodal imaging approaches with one another and using the data between those two, between those multiple multimodal imaging approaches with one another. The workflow for the image analysis, once we've generated this imaging data, is based upon the specific research question. In this case, one of our core questions is trying to understand who is in the context of this granuloma. Where are different types of immune cells? Uh, where should they be? Where are they not? Trying to understand how treatments are affecting the distribution of these cells. Um, the distribution from therapeutic, the distribution from each other, overall population, so counting the cells, understanding who is there and how the concentration of these cells are changing as a function of treatment, location. Um, so there's a number of different spatial um, and temporal spatial parameters that we're acquiring from these granulomas to try and better understand which of these therapeutics are working and try and understand how changes these therapeutic, regimen, therapeutic regimens change the population of immune cells in these granulomas. So we're trying to address really complex questions. And for this research project, it's really open-ended. So we're going first to try to understand who is there, um, who is near each other, what are they doing, and how are these populations uh, changing? And then from there, we're inferring what's happening with the immune cell population and how we can improve our treatment regimen for subsequent studies uh, with these rabbit models. So this is a really unique approach to understanding how our therapeutic is working and generating huge amounts of data from a single piece of tissue and a few uh, serial section slides. The, um, the last application here I was going to talk about is how we use multiplex image analysis and quantification in practice for immuno-oncology applications. This is the most common uh, type of work that we're doing in this space. There's lots of tissues that are being sent our way from all different types of studies, but these tissues tend to be precious. We don't have a lot of tissue, and what we're trying to do is get as much data as possible from the tissue. We're not trying to waste it for traditional IHC or h &E. We're trying to go well beyond that and get a huge amount of data from a single slide. So in this case here, I'm just going to show a simple panel of five labels, including DAPI. And in this case, we have PAN-CK. So we're using PAN-CK to isolate the tumoral area from the non-tumoral area on each one of these slides, such that we can answer some questions about T-cell penetration into our tumoral area, which I'll get to in a moment here. Now, for multiplex immunofluorescence uh, cell quantification, one of the things we do for all these projects, and one of the things that's in our standard report for all of our clients, is just simple cell counts. So in this case, we're isolating our stromal area from our tumoral area, and then we're counting how many CD3 positive cells do we have, how many CD45 positive cells, uh, PD1 positive cells do we have, and then the combinations of those markers with one another and trying to understand where are these different types of cells in relation to being the tumor, being the stroma, and how does that distribution change? For every slide uh, for a project like this where we have um, uh, five labels that we're looking at, we prepare this report for every slide and we can go well beyond this type of report, which I'll get to in a moment, but we're showing how many of each type of cell do we have, what is the total number of cells in our stroma, and our tumoral area on the overall slide, and then for each one of those cells, what are they actually labeling for? Of course, this gets much more complicated the more labels that we do, but this table output allows us to answer a lot of fundamental questions about what's going on on that slide. And then to take this a step further, what we can do is start to answer more complex questions about the kinetics of what's going on with this treatment. So in this case here, the dark purple area on the outside of this uh, slide, which is highlighted here, is our stromal region. And the lighter area, which all of our lines are pointing into, is our tumoral region. And what we're drawing is for each one of these T cells, we're trying to understand how far it is from the periphery, and we're inferring how far have those uh, T cells gone as a function of what they're labeling for. This allows us to try and understand um, how the immune cell penetration changes as a function of uh, label. 
And for this, of course, we're, we're assuming that there's not stromal area right above the slide. Of course, that would ruin these rays that we're drawing from the periphery. Uh, but this allows us to actually quantify some of those kinetics about what is going on with our penetration of immune cells into this tissue. We do the same thing with 3D cell culture models. So we're trying to understand in a high content, high throughput in vitro model, how T cells are invading into a tumoral steroid, for example. We do the same exact type of analysis, whether it's on a slide or whether it's in a high content format, to understand how this penetration is happening um, and the kinetics behind it. And just to show you an overlay here of our um, raw data versus what we're getting with the, the penetration, we can see um, for these, we can see the ray and the heat map of where these T cells actually are over the slide. That allows us to see um, on our slide picture what's going on with our T cells. The reason this is important is we can actually share this data with a pathologist such that if we have an H&E stain and an IHC stain and also a multiplex slide, we can overlay if there's serial sections these heat maps for our pathologist. So if the pathologist wants to do the traditional evaluation but also add in some of this data as well, we can add heat maps onto their data sets through our BitSlide platform such that they can also get some of that data and understand uh, within the traditional pathological context what's going on with our T cells and where they are. So we're able to do a lot of different types of data manipulation, um, image processing, and image uh, sharing such that we can also involve a pathologist if that's required for a project. For most of our projects, we're not typically working with a pathology team. Usually it's quantitative uh, image analysis based um, uh, quantification for these slides. But we can loop in a pathologist, and we've done that many times for projects where that's required. And also we might want to validate the results we're getting um, in immunofluorescence are correlated to what we're seeing in traditional immunohistochemistry. So there is an opportunity for that depending upon the nature of the project. But most of our projects are using quantitative uh, readouts for the endpoints. And um, again, just to show the uh, automated cell counting, we can break this out by tumoral area, non-tumoral area. We can also highlight proliferating regions or non-proliferating regions of the, um, of the slide. So we're using KI67 as our marker to do that. And that allows us to also go beyond this and start counting um, cells in those different regions, in the tumoral area, in a proliferating region, near a proliferating region. Um, so there's a lot of different types of questions we can address based upon exactly what our research question is. But the possibilities with this type of analysis are really endless. For every cell um, that we're looking at on a slide, we have the X and Y coordinate for it. And then we also, based upon our co-registration with DAPI, we know what labels um, that individual cell um, is lighting up for. And we can use that to answer all different research questions. So the possibilities are really endless with how we use this data for different types of questions. And again, to show this um, in a couple of different ways, and we usually, for our reports, we'll have a couple of graphs, a couple of tables uh, for our clients. We can show proliferating region versus non-proliferating region, who's there, what are they doing. Um, and then we can go uh, the next step here and compare side by side the different types of regions to the overall tissue and understand how things are changing as a function of where we are within the tissue. And this allows us to really provide our clients a detailed view of the immune cell population, how it's changing as a function of treatment, and how it's changing as a function of any parameter that they're interested in, and also how those cells are interacting with each other. So ultimately what we're providing uh, for our clients from this approach is a way for them to answer really complex questions. We're generating a huge amount of imaging data, and then from that imaging data, we're able to use it for any type of research question that our clients have to understand the immune system, to look at infectious disease, or really any application. The approach that we've developed, we can use with antibodies that have been used in traditional immunohistochemistry, and that allows us to look at any kind of research application, just um, even outside of immuno-oncology. We worked on several projects in other disease contexts that have nothing to do with the immune system. We want to look at many labels on a single slide, such as neuroscience, where a lot of researchers are trying to look at the complex interplay between different types of cells within the brain. So the flexibility and possibilities of this platform are really open. And if you have additional questions or anything at all on the approach, I'd love to, um, love to answer that. And with that, I'm going to open it up to the Q&A portion of this presentation. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Michael, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have any questions you'd like to ask, please do so now 
just click on that ask a question box located on the far left of your screen and we'll answer as many questions as we have time for. So let's get started. It looks like we already have some great questions coming in. Our first question, Michael, <clears throat> are cover slips used for imaging? Uh, typically in practice, yes, they are. But um, if there's a project that does not require cover slips, we can certainly work with that. But for most of the time, we're processing with cover slips. Thank you so much. And does the price include antibodies and should we provide the antibodies required? Typically, the price does include antibodies. We have a minimum of 10 slides we process. The reason for that is if you have a project that has, let's say, eight antibodies, we're going to spend you know, three, four thousand dollars to procure materials. So typically, we have a minimum. But if some clients have antibodies they've developed internally, that they've validated, they want to send along, we can certainly do that and adjust the price accordingly. But typically, we're including antibodies in that price. Thank you so much. Now, our next audience member wants to know, how does it differ or what are the advantages compared to Miltonia's Maxima? I think I said that correctly. Sure. Yeah, with the Milteni system and a lot of other systems that are out there, we get to the same place. I think with Milteni systems, you can get to more markers per slide. And there's a few other systems out there, proprietary reagents and uh, equipment where you can do that as well. For our system, we're using off-the-shelf hardware, we're using off-the-shelf antibodies that have been validated in folks' labs before, but ultimately we get to the same place. They might be able to get more markers per slide. I'm not exactly sure what their cost is on a per slide basis, but the end result would probably be similar to our approach um, as our most approach is getting to the same spot after they're completed. Thank you so much, and I want to thank our audience members for these great questions coming in. Keep it up. Michael, how do we know these immune cells did not enter from above or below? That's a good question. They certainly could have. We're assuming they didn't, but um, there certainly could be a stromal area right above our slide, and therefore we're saying it went 50 microns, and in fact it went one micron. So we're making the assumption that's not true, and with larger sample sizes, we can average that out and see what it looks like. But um, yeah, that, that totally could be true, but we're assuming it's not the case, and we're not having like slivers of tissue and right above it, there's stromal area. So it is an assumption for sure. Thank you so much. Our next audience member says, first, great technique, great talk. She wants to know, could you go 60X or more? We could. We certainly could. Uh, we could also do confocal imaging um, of these for a bit thicker sections. We can also do light sheet imaging, uh, not at 60X, but there's a couple different modalities that we can take and we can go higher resolution if needed. The only problem there is it you know, greatly increases the file size and increases some of the complexity for processing and shipment of data. Um, but we can certainly do it. There are some clients and some projects where higher bag is required, but most of the time in practice, we're looking at 20X, maybe 40X, but we could do it. Thank you very much. Now, is analysis modules or software created per client? Typically, no. Typically, most of the modules that we use have already been built. Um, we have a large toolbox of different modules for different types of questions. But I would say most of the questions that were asked from our pharma and biotech clients all revolve around the same types of principles, cell counting, distances, co-localization, um, which are relatively straightforward uh, modules that you'd find in any um, image analysis software, whether it's Halo or uh, even an ImageJ. Um, so pretty standard off-the-shelf stuff that we're using for those questions. Thank you very much. And again, thank you to our audience members. We love the participation. Michael, which tissue type do you use? Is it the FFPE or the frozen? We can do either or. We tend to get better results with frozen, but some of our clients just have FFP box and we can work with those. If there is a lot of background noise, we can try and mitigate that or we can try and choose channels around that, which might limit how many labels we can get per panel. But that's something that we would discuss prior to starting the project is the exact approach that we would use. Thank you very much. Now, is this next person says so there is no tissue damage or for consequent staining when the cover slips removed between the staining so um there might be but it's not significant and from what we've seen of doing uh the same label multiple times one after another and then co-localizing that we haven't seen changes in that epitope um, the process is reversible so we've also done follow-up traditional IHC and haven't seen changes in those epitopes either. It's 
possible um, we have some damage, but we're not seeing it on a macro scale or on the individual epitopes. And Michael, which imaging mass cytometry is best complemented with vesicle? Is it ion path or is it fluidime? Um, it, I would say it doesn't really matter. Um, in practice, we might take a serial section and uh, do fluorescence and also do IMC. Uh, we can use ion path or fluidime. Um, it gets us to the same place. Uh, but if we're trying to get more markers per slide, we'd use either one of those. So I wouldn't say one's best. Thank you. And how do you strip antibodies and get sample ready for the next round? Sure. So it's a simple process that we do. It can be automated, but most of the time we're processing samples in batches of eight or so. And we're using the EasyPlex reagents that we develop to strip off those uh, antibodies at room temperature. Typically it takes about 12 hours for us to do that. Uh, once that process is complete and we've relabeled, we get them back onto the, uh, the imager. Uh, but most of the time it's done on a bench top and you know, small batches of slides, depending upon how large the project is, but it can also be automated if we have larger projects. Now, our next question is about AB slide. Is there a minimum order or cost per the AB slide, Michael? We try to do projects with a minimum order size of 10 slides. Um, it depends on the project. So like a three label project versus a 10 label project will have different minimums. It really comes down to, we don't want to spend $15,000 on antibodies and process one slide because then you're paying you know, $20,000 per slide, which isn't feasible. So it depends a bit on the uh, the project, depends on the antibodies themselves and the scale of the project. We don't want to have a project that's incredibly expensive for one single slide if it doesn't make sense for the researcher. Thank you. And we have a few more questions from our audience members. What light sheet platform are you using and what clearing techniques are you offering? Sure, so we have, uh, we have several confocals in our lab, which we tend to process about one millimeter thick tissues or less on in a high content setup. Uh, but for light sheet, we have a movie spin from Bruker. Um, it was, I guess, made originally by Luxendo, who was acquired by Bruker. Uh, but we have that system in our lab. We actually started our company as a tissue clearing company about five years ago. So a little before Clarity, we developed a tissue clearing technique called Visicol Histo that we sell through a number of different companies and also through our website, which is um, an antipathic solvent-based approach, which is um, really rapid and works really well. But as a company, we will use any tissue clearing approach. We've used really everything, cubic clarity, scale, CDB, um, you know, all the clearing techniques that you could possibly imagine we use. Like all imaging techniques, there are some that are great for some research questions and some that are great for others. But we will employ really any tissue clearing technique that is required for a research question in our lab. But typically, I would say we're using our physical histo approach uh, for whole tissues, our physical histo M approach for organoids. And then for whole brains, when we're looking at fluorescence, um, uh, fluorescent protein, we might use one of the aqueous techniques that's out there just to really try and minimize um, any shrinkage and also minimize any quenching of fluorophores. Thank you, Michael. And we have a final question. You can work, can you work with human and marine tissues? Yeah, so we, uh, we can work with really any tissue. We've gotten projects with all different types of, um, of animals, um, but it just depends on the availability of the antibodies. What we like to have is our clients have already validated antibody internally. They routinely use it in traditional IHC, and we can adapt that into the, uh, the project. Um, so yeah, it's definitely compatible with those. We do need to have the antibodies to actually go ahead and do that. Thank you very much. And actually, we have time for one more question. Do you use labeled secondary antibodies or are your primary antibodies labeled with fluorescent dye? Typically, we're conjugating the primaries. Um, that's usually the approach, but it depends on the panels and how large the panels are. We can do secondaries, but choosing the species and choosing how those match up uh, can be challenging. So it just it just kind of depends on the, um, the project. Um, but yeah, it just, it just depends. We can use either or. Michael, thank you so much. And actually, we have time for a couple more. Are you also active within the European academic servicing? Sure. So we have clients, um, big, small, huge pharma, and also academic and NGOs that we work with. And that's uh, really international. We accept tissues. We accept slides. Uh, we'll work with um, companies and work with academics to make sure we can actually get slides imported in through customs. Um, so usually we're getting tissues, 
um, slides. Uh, we could get hard drives of data for digital path only projects, but it's relatively simple to transport those and to work on those. We have a full histopathology core here too, so we can get blocks and cut sections and uh, get frozen samples as well and uh, cryostat those. So we can definitely work with a lot of different types of researchers because of that. And Michael, what kind of run control do you use for the multiplex staining and what is your philosophy of it? Yeah, that's a great question. This is something that um, we get from a lot of researchers to try to understand how we're going to validate the approach, how we're going to validate the labeling and ensure that as we're running these assays that we're continuing to have the same robustness that we typically have. So this will depend on the client's preference. For more experimental projects, I would say we have less validation criteria that are used. Um, but uh, for some clients, what we'll do is we'll get a, a series of control samples, positive and negative control samples. We'll run the paddles on those, and we'll ensure that the labels that we are supposed to see are actually showing up, and whether they're not showing up, um, they're not showing up. And then on a routine basis for our instruments, uh, we're qualifying it. We're running through our IQ, OQ, PQ process. And then if we need to, for some projects, we will go ahead and rerun control samples every time we rerun a new batch of samples just to ensure the labeling is what it's supposed to be and it's being seen as expected. But those validation criteria really are driven a lot of times from our clients. We will sometimes start projects with off-the-shelf validated panels or we'll be asked to develop new panels. And then through that new panel validation process, the first phase of our project would be to ensure that we can actually validate those panels and then go ahead and, um, and image them and they actually show up where they're supposed to. So that's typically how we start these projects. And regarding those panels, our audience member wants to know, do you supply the pre-optimized panels? And if so, are they tissue specific? So the panels that we have uh, that are pre-validated right now are per human. Uh, we have four different panels right now. And we have all the validation criteria that we've used on our website. So which, um, which tissues we've used those in, how those tissues were fixed. Some of our clients will say, hey, we have that same tissue. We uh, want you, though, to go ahead and revalidate them in our tissue before you get started, such that we don't run a project and the label's not there. And the question is, is it really not there? Or is it the panel's not working with this specific tissue? So that's something that um, we will rely upon our clients for. Uh, but yeah, it just depends on the client project. Thank you very much. Now, what are some of the problems you run into, Michael, when developing new panels for multiplexing? Sure. So this is anyone who spent a lot of uh, bench stop time doing uh, immunofluorescence knows these problems well. We could run into autofluorescence. Uh, we could run into a problem where we don't have the right species for our labeling, or we have to have uh, many panels because we can't get four or five panels on the same. Uh, we don't usually have problems with conjugation and actually conjugating our antibodies. Uh, but I would say it's usually a mixture of um, having the right control samples, uh, having labels that show up the way they're supposed to, and then also just making sure we mix and match the panels the right way. Designing the panels is crucial because it allows you to reduce the amount of time required for processing. So how you choose your antibodies, which ones you pair into these panels of four and five labels is really critical. But um, some tissues will just have a challenging time labeling because of background fluorescence or not really seeing the epitopes that we should. So we'll troubleshoot with our clients. But that doesn't happen too often. But when it does, we'll pause, interact with our client. And if we decide that for a specific marker we just cannot develop a panel for, we'll decide what to do from there and make a decision before we jump into processing dozens or hundreds of slides for the client. Thank you so much. And we have time for a couple of more how much variation do you see in multiplexing staining? I guess it depends on exactly how the question is asked, but what we've done for this is we've looked at slides and gone in with one label, uh, stripped the antibody, gone in again, gone in again, and tried to co-localize and validate that we're getting the same staining intensity, we're getting the same exact co-localization time and time again. And the concordance that we've shown with that is really good. Um, but as far as variation, there might be um, changes in intensity, so maybe 5 or 10% changes in fluorescence intensity that we'll see. Most of our work, though, we're doing co-localization and counting and not relying upon actual intensity, so it tends not to matter that much in the actual image analysis portion of things. Uh, but there will be some variation, but it tends not to matter that much in practice from what we've seen. And Michael, how do you remove the autofluorescence? 
It depends on the tissue and it depends on uh, how long it's been sitting for and what type of autofluorescence it is. Sometimes if the autofluorescence is really bad in a particular channel, we can go ahead and actually subtract that out so we know exactly which each one of our uh, laser lines and our filter sets, we know exactly what things should look like and based upon uh, what we're seeing, we can actually digitally subtract out the, um, the autofluorescence or we might try one of our traditional uh, histological processing techniques to remove the autofluorescence uh, chemically, uh, bleaching and things like that. So it just kind of depends. That is more of an issue of samples been sitting for a really long time. We see it commonly with uh, human brain tissue that's been sitting for a while and it's overfixed. Uh, but it also depends on what kind of uh, autofluorescence we're looking at. Thank you so much, Michael. And our final question that we have time for today how much do pathologists want to use chromogenic versus the fluorescent approach for multiplex staining? So pathologists tend not to, at least in our experience, like multiplexing period, um, especially when you're talking 4, 10, 15, 20, because you're not using a pathologist for the evaluation. Typically, it's all computer-based just because there's so much data that's being generated. So from our viewpoint, I guess the pathologist doesn't really have a preference because it would be neither. It would be traditional histopath and looking at it and come up with a qualitative interpretation. But they probably would be more comfortable, I would say, with chromogenic just because more what they're used to. Um, but I don't think they necessarily have a, a preference for one or the other. Michael, this has been a great presentation, and I want to thank our live audience. It's been amazing. Do you have any closing remarks before we go? I just appreciate the opportunity to present, and if anyone has any questions or would like to discuss a specific project or chat further, we'd love to uh, get in touch here, so thank you. Well, I want to thank you again, Dr. Michael Johnson, for your time today and for your important research, and I also want to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Lyco Biosystems, for underwriting today's educational webcast. And before we go, I want to thank our audience again for joining us today and for their interesting questions questions we did not have time for today, and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by our speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. And this webcast can be viewed on-demand. Labrador will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, take care and stay healthy. Bye-bye, everyone.